Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, my name is Eric Bush. I'm the CEO of Demand Driven Technologies and uh, pleased to be here to present you with this update on uh, building supply chain agility in the automotive industry. Uh, this is part two of a webinar series that we've done to kind of bring to light uh, the opportunities for supply chain improvement in the automotive industry. Uh, from the standpoint of today's agenda, I want to kind of build on some of the comments that were made in the previous uh, webinar that we held with Satwerka around the automotive industry context and setting kind of the scene that I see the automotive industry evolving in, uh, some of the core issues and challenges that are occurring out there. And then we'll talk a little bit about uh, the criticality of the Toyota production system. Anybody who's working in automotive is familiar with that term, some of the key concepts in there. I just wanna use those as a bit of a backdrop because they kind of help really uh, illustrate the opportunity for the application of demand-driven concepts into that environment. We'll talk a bit about demand signal variation and what is the kind of what we call a waterfall of the forecasted demand from an OEM to a supplier and what really that represents in the way of uh, challenges from a supply chain planning standpoint. Uh, and then we'll talk about some of the DDMRP specific features that relate to automotive along with how we bring those to life in our Intuit Flow software. So quite a bit of ground to cover, um, but I think you'll find the content quite, quite interesting. Um, I had the great privilege earlier in my career of working in Detroit when I was with IBM. I managed a number of automotive suppliers as a uh, account executive. And then also I spent uh, several years as the industry solutions supply chain leader uh, for that region. Uh, this was based in Detroit, had quite a bit of interaction with automotive industry folks. Um, I've always been fascinated with cars, you know, kind of geeked around with them a bit when I was a younger man uh, and bought my first Pontiac. Uh, and I've always kind of been impressed with really what value you can get in an automobile. I know people have their complaints about their cars and we all have those frustrations. But when you really look at this, and everything it represents in terms of assembling a vehicle and the actual price of it, it, it's kind of a bit mind boggling. If you tried to do this custom, it would cost you hundreds of thousands of dollars. But even today, cars are actually in my mind quite affordable, especially when you think of all of the technology that is involved in them. And this is just an illustration of you know the wide range of parts that go into an automobile. But when you think about how do we gather all these things together, create the sub assemblies, put the vehicle together, make sure that it's going to meet its warranty and all of those other factors. It's really an impressive uh, feat of engineering, manufacturing capability, and uh, human ingenuity. Um, there's a lot changing, though, in the industry. There's a, obviously the big shift towards electrical vehicles, uh, and that's going to continue to accelerate as we go through time. And when you think about it, it's it's pretty impressive in the changes it's going to create within the parts that go into an automobile. If you just look at the com the comparison between a gasoline engine, which has somewhere in the neighborhood of 2000 moving parts to an electric motor, which has 18, you kind of get an idea of how much the supply chain landscape is gonna change. If you're a company building components that go into gasoline engines, you're seeing the writing on the wall. And I think the shift to electric vehicles is gonna to continue to move very, very quickly as we go forward. You've seen all of the major automotive uh, OEMs uh, now coming out with pure electric vehicles. It's not just Tesla anymore. And that competition is gonna spur further innovation and change in that component or that segment of the uh, market. And I think it's gonna become more and more the dominant area. Um, obviously the drivetrain components, those that relate to transferring the power of the engine or the motor into the movement of the vehicle, things like a transmission, a drive shaft, the differential that go into a typical gasoline powered uh, automobile versus in an electric environment is really typically a direct drive from the motor directly to the wheel. And there's no intermediate uh, intervening technologies in between there. Um, we've seen the recharging infrastructure continue to grow and scale out. And you know, even further down the road here, the reality of self-driving vehicles is gonna become more and more predominant in the uh, industry. So suffice to say, the industry is evolving rapidly. And obviously that's gonna have a big impact on the relevant supply chain aspects that we all deal with on a daily basis. So I think it's quite exciting times. There will be some winners and losers. Anytime you have a major shift like this happening 
in an industry. And it will be interesting to see how all of that plays out as we go forward. <clears throat> so within all of that, and, and you can, we could go for hours about talking about the shifts that are occurring in the industry. I wanted to come back and talk about the concepts behind the Toyota production system. This really became prominent in manufacturing thinking um, in the late 70s, early 80s, and continues to persist uh, to the day because of just the virtues that it brought to uh, the manufacturing environment. And these are the seven kind of core principles uh, that you would find in, in any literature around the Toyota production system. Can create a continuous process flow to bring uh, problems to the surface. The idea of building in quality and, and making sure that the process is managed in a way to surface those issues so that they get identified and addressed quickly is kind of at the foundation of everything in the TPS kind of model. Use a pull system to avoid overproduction. And what that really means is avoid reliance on forecasted demand wherever you can. A pull system is one that replaces materials based on how they are being consumed. And as part of that, the whole Kanban philosophy came to uh, the forefront. We're going to talk about that a little bit here. But I'm a real believer that using a pull system wherever you can is going to gain you improvements in your supply chain. You will ensure that the material is available. You're going to pace to the actual demand. So you're not going to be getting those distortions at inaccurate forecasts or signals can create for you. And there's uh, intrinsic benefits in all of that. Level out the workload. <clears throat> the more we can pace the uh, production to a, an achievable rate and then uh, utilize that to bring stability and operational balance into our environment uh, will obviously help us dramatically. Um, stop to fix the problems. Get the um, uh, issues fixed really at the core. And obviously the, the quality that Toyota was really known for, and, and really all vendors now, I think all of the OEMs have to a dramatic degree compared to when I was a younger man, um, have to improve vehicle quality tremendously. So the, these philosophies have been obviously quite effective in that regard. Standardize your tasks uh, because they then allow you to create an environment for continuous improvement because it becomes easier to see where there's opportunities to make things better. Visual control is very critical. Um, it allows us to have a better understanding of where the core issues are. Um, things like Kanban loops, having greater visibility within the production environment really helps isolate and identify issues where they may exist and get them resolved in a quick fashion. And then obviously find technologies that are reliable, thoroughly tested and serve the people. I think at the end of the day, the goal of software should be to make the user's experience um, easier to manage, more understandable and things of that. And we take that priority as a real critical uh, dimension that we have to pursue within our software development here at DD Tech. <clears throat> and I wanted to use this illustration because this talks about the, the concept of a Kanban loop. A Kanban loop is a way of ensuring that materials are available at the assembly line or at the point of manufacturing. It provides a visible signal. In other words, a bin that may contain, in this case, nine items, nine parts that will recirculate to get refilled and then come back to the point of production. It creates a very easy to manage, visible way of ensuring the parts are available at the point of need in the appropriate quantities to keep the production line flowing. And that process is very much the core of a pull flow kind of uh, production mindset that we're going to gain benefits from doing that. We have to size that Kanban loop in an effective manner to ensure that we don't stock out the line, uh, but that we also don't over accumulate material at that point of use because that can create obstructions and can impact the actual production process. And so I think the Kanban philosophy is very much behind any solution that is trying to advocate for true pull systems. One of the limitations of Kanban in the early days is was it was it was that it was physical, meaning it was bins. Some folks would use a card system and other ways of indicating the need for a resupply of materials. That would all depend on various, excuse me, other factors that you would have to deal with. But 
the idea of visibility makes it easier for users to understand where actions are required and how to take those correctly. And we'll talk about that a little bit here in a few minutes when we draw a corollary between the way a DDMRP buffer is designed and the typical ways you would size a Kanban loop. With that in mind, now let's talk about the tiers within the automotive industry. Um, OEMs, original equipment manufacturers, are the top of the table. Uh, they are the end item producer of the vehicles. Uh, companies like Ford, Toyota, Honda, et cetera, would be in the cadre that represents the OEMs. To generate and make their production schedule, they utilize typically MRP logic to generate part requirements forecast for that production schedule. They have a master production schedule in place. They uh, generate that well out into the future so that they can then share, i use my pointer here. They can then share their requirements out to their suppliers because that gives the suppliers some advance notice as to what the requirements will be. Um, there's a concept in the automotive industry as there are in other industries of a frozen period within which you're not allowed to make changes. So this is a goal to try to synchronize and ensure that the harmony between the OEM, the tier one, tier two, tier N suppliers is kind of respected and done in a manner that makes it a fair game or a fairer game for everybody to participate in. <clears throat> um, the OEM themselves will receive material based on something typically called a sequencing schedule. In other words, they have very little raw inventory at the plant itself and arrive uh, materials arriving throughout the day in a just-in-time kind of manner to feed the actual assembly line process. Um, and so this helps keep visible and um, ensures that we've got the right materials on time, that idea of the sequencing schedule. But the concept that there is a schedule, that there are times for deliveries, and all of those are very much at the OEM level at the automotive assembly plant, how material is gonna arrive into their environment. <clears throat> so based on then the OEM's uh, forecasted requirements, their production schedule, um, and we'll use a wiring harness here as just an example because it's easy to see the, the different components. A wiring harness is gonna be within a vehicle and it kind of connects all the lighting systems and other electrical components within a vehicle and it's, really one of the very first things that goes into the actual automotive body is the wiring harness because it's going to be tucked away, tucked away into channels and things like that. But a manufacturer of a wiring harness would be getting the OEM uh, requirements forecast. They would be generating from that their material forecast for all of the components that go into a wiring harness. In this case, you can have several hundred um, components. There are going to be little connectors. There's going to be strands of wire. There's going to be tape and insulators and other items that go into that. But that's how they're going to build out their forecast and their production schedule for the wiring harnesses that will then be sent to the OEM based on the sequencing schedule and the requirement for the actual automotive assembly environment. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> the tier one are going to be buying their components from their vendors. These can be within the same company, you know, com uh, compatible vendors that are, or uh, uh, plants that are feeding components that are going to go into that final harness, or they could be outside suppliers, typically on something called a planning calendar. And this is where there's a concept called milk runs, where we are going to have a, uh, a range with a given vendor of we can pick up on items on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or just Mondays, or just Fridays, or any permutation within that. And this helps them plan the packaging and the readiness of the materials so that as the, the trucks making the milk runs come through and pick up the materials from the supplier, they're able to gather those and utilize them, you know, and have them available based on that planning calendar. And that's one of the key features we're going to talk about when we get over to the software side. It's this idea of trying to synchronize activities to a certain calendar because that helps bring some stability into the entire environment. Based on the wire harness schedule, we're then going to have a component schedule for the production at the plant that is providing, in this case, the connectors that are going to go into the wiring harness. Typically, you're going to be based on a weekly part uh, and material forecast. There may be items that they're going to have to a tier three supplier that are coming in as well, and it can go down several layers within the automotive industry as to where a given 
company may bar be bar participating. In, in this case, these items would be shipped based on a planning calendar assignment. They're available to be picked up on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, as an example, things of that factor. So this idea of planning calendar and how it relates to the way we synchronize activity within the automotive industry is really, really critical. This is an overly simplified explanation. I know there's a lot of text on the chart here, but it, in essence, this captures the way the automotive uh, industry works and how it coordinates activities across the different layers of the supply chain. The concept of the frozen period is important. The idea here is that within the uh, frozen period, typically the lead time of the item and maybe a little bit more, no changes to the demand signal are allowed. Now that's desirable and it, and it's aspirational in some cases, it's held strictly in other cases, but you know the principle here is that we want to create some stability so that the production at the supplying plants can be managed and is less susceptible to variation and other factors. Changes outside of that frozen period though are permitted. And we'll show you an example here <coughs> of a uh, item waterfall of what the demand signal fluctuation was week by week leading up to that frozen period and the actual uh, production week for the material itself. So this idea of frozen periods is something important to understand and respect within the automotive industry. And uh, obviously our software has been designed to address that. So this is what we call a waterfall. What you're looking at are for given production weeks, this is weeks three, four, and so on through uh, 13. What was the forecast, forecasted requirement for this item from week uh, 43 of 22, 44, and so forth? And then coming up through week two, which would be the last week of forecast before the actual production week. So you can see kind of the demand fluctuation that we're seeing in each of these columns. And this is for a given item. If you were to look at a wide range of items, you'd see and consolidated them all together, you'd see a similar pattern that the numbers do move around. And so here we're 13 weeks in advance of the production week. We're at 7,800. We come down to 2,800, uh, stay there for a little bit. Then we jump all the way up to 12,600 or so. That signal stays the same. Then it starts to diminish again, starts to fall down. Then the week prior to the production week, we're at 4,376. If we look at the, what the actual demand was, this is the actual um, production for that item for that week, we are at 6,381. So when we compare that to the average of this period, it's not too far off. It's only 97%, which is the average forecasted demand of 6,560. We were at 6,381, so 97.2% of that value. However, when you look at the range of the forecast, it was everything from 1260-673, which is almost double the average, to as low as, <coughs> uh, this should be 2854, which was the uh, minimum demand during the period. And that was from a, a week that's not in this horizon. But you can see quite a range here of everything from 28% of the average to almost 2x. And you can see as we look across the weeks, a very similar pattern emerging. Even in these periods, I'm highlighting those periods that are either 30% above or 30% below the average. You can see the actual gap here is, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of 60% high or low, you know, up to a 60% range in the forecast signal. And this is not uncommon. Um, I think there's a perception that because the automotive assembly process is so well defined and so tightly managed and the like, that the demand signals to the supplying tiers would actually be pretty reliable. But in point of fact, there is a fair bit of bias in it. And if you look at the actual demand versus what the forecasted demand is, we can see we're about, you know, 25 to 30% below what the average forecasted demand was for that period. So, the reality is there is a lot of demand signal variation. And I think that's a real reason to think about focusing on true pull concepts because they will give you a better uh, position from an inventory management standpoint and allow you to pace the actual resupply of materials much the way a Kanban loop would to the actual consumption that's occurring in the, um, in the various tiers that, in the automotive industry. So we've got this bias. It can be as much as 15 to 25%. 
even in environments where the client has done very well, a lot of uh, the automotive industry suppliers that we work with have, you know, before they implemented DDMRP, were running in the 10 to 11 turns per year, which is pretty good considering average manufacturing is around five to five and a half. Even in those environments, they've been able to find 20 to 30% further reductions in inventory based on the application of DDMRP concepts. Um, so there's a number of factors though to think about. Why would it be that our forecast or our actual demand is typically lower? Well, when you think about it, there's a lot of factors that could impact the OEM master schedule. Shortages of other components. Obviously in the pandemic, we've had this in wide range of cir circumstances. You know, a lot of it coverage in the industry over the last several years around the supply chain issues in automotive, but shortages of components were impacting their schedule and contributing to the kind of demand signal variation that we're seeing here. There were labor and staffing issues uh, because of the pandemic, because of uh, COVID restrictions and things like that. People weren't available. Obviously, if there's not people available to staff various positions in the production line, that's gonna change either the pace of production or you know, may bring it to a full halt for periods of time. Um, assembly line issues, any me mechanical process can have issues and uh, variations. So those undoubtedly can have an impact. And then obviously at the end of the day, what is the market buying? And how is that gonna affect the cascade of demand down through the OEMs into the supplier tiers? So there's the reality is we do have demand variation. The reality is we be, need better techniques to manage that. And the DDMRP concept of pacing material replenishment to actual demand does consistently show lower inventory levels while protecting part availability and ensuring that we're able to keep the lines running based on the parts being available. So just for a second here, I know many of you will be familiar with DDMRP um, that typically is uh, um, companies that are looking into this have gained some familiarity. The core concept here of demand-driven MRP is we're gonna to pace to real consumption. We believe that that's the most accurate demand signal. And by adopting the most accurate demand signal, we can reduce the impact that inaccurate forecasts can have if we're using a conventional MRP forecast-driven planning technique. And so when we present this to folks who are new, the idea is, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. If I could only do that, the problem is I need to plan ahead because I don't have the material available. I need to get the materials from my supplier, then manufacture them, convert them, and get them ready for shipment. So if I don't start that chain of activities well in advance, I will not be able to ship based on what's actually being consumed. And that's where the concept of a DDMRP buffer comes in. Um, the whole principle of a DDMRP buffer is that we're going to be ensuring constant availability. If we can do that, if we can ensure constant availability, then we can pace to this actual consumption and we can get to a better place. And it, it's kind of a different way of thinking about how to solve the problem. There's three dimensions to a DDMRP buffer. We always start with um, the yellow zone, which is uh, size to cover usage over the lead time. And I'm sorry, my chart here is a little misaligned here. Uh, yellow zone is covered to size usage over the lead time. So if I look at that rate of demand and I know I have a seven or 10 day lead time, I'm going to size that yellow zone to cover the amount of material use during that lead time. My order point is top of yellow. It would imply then that when the order is received, I should be at bottom of yellow. So I know I need to cover my usage over that lead time cycle. Now, we all know that demand during that period may vary or the supply order may come late. So we have to way to protect our buffer zones. And that's through what the red zone does here, which is illustrated here. It's size to address item variation. And in reality, the core principle we should focus on is managing variations. The more we understand variation, the better we'll be able to ensure constant availability and the more we can adopt cleaner signals to drive our supply chain. So this is gonna be based on items, uh, the variation, it could be supply variation, demand variation, a combination of both. The more volatile the environment, the heavier the red zone will be, the thicker it will be, because we need that to protect our ability to ensure constant availability. But having done that, we gain that advantage. We have constant availability. We've adopted this cleaner demand signal, and we've put ourselves in a much, much better place. The green zone is going to be sized based on typically minimum order quantities 
or often an order cycle. We want to order once a week, so the green zone will be one week's worth of supply. Uh, or it may have a minimum order quantity that's going to dictate because that's the vendor's requirement or our batch requirement. We order from top of yellow and we order up to top of green. When we set these DDMRP buffers correctly, we get constant availability, we paste to the actual demand that's coming in, and we find that we have achieved much better service levels while carrying less inventory. <coughs> this idea of constant availability is also important because it does another critical benefit that I think is very relevant in the automotive industry is that it creates what we call decoupling points. If I know that the upstream item is always going to be available, then I don't have to wait for this uh, up further upstream lead time. As well, I get a dampening of the variation of the signal that comes through. So remember that waterfall and the amount that signal's moving around. Well, if I don't have to take all of that and keep adjusting my schedules because it's moving up and down so much, and I'm instead relying on my buffers to tell us what we need to actually act on, we will be in a better place. We create decoupling points within the layers in the supply chain. We compress our lead times because we don't need to wait for this upstream activity to occur. That coverage is built into the way the buffer is designed. That gives us a much, much better position to be in than trying to manage this dependent chain of events, especially when we have that demand signal variation that we were talking about. When we look in practice at how a buffer works, there's something called the net flow equation. We take our on-hand inventory, add to that the open supply orders, and from that we'll take the sales or consumption due today, any future demand spikes that are within the lead time, that results in the net flow. And that line will typically hover between top of green, dipping into the yellow zone when the reorder point is achieved, and then ordering back up to top of green again. So you'll see typically the net flow line in a buffer trend graph, excuse me, following this kind of sawtooth pattern. At the same time, the inventory will typically trend in the lower part of the yellow zone and on occasion dipping into the red zone. The red zone is there to protect variation. It's not the same as safety stock. Safety stock is the idea of an artificial floor that says we never want to go below this level. Uh, the red zone in a DDMRP buffer is there to help absorb the variation and reduce the amount of expediting and overreactions that often happen in a traditional MRP kind of environment. And this would be a great looking buffer trend. This is kind of what you would expect to see and we'll kind of see this illustrated when we get into the software here shortly. I think this is great. I think there's so much dependence on Kanban loops, um, not only in automotive, but in a number of other industries. But there is absolutely a direct correlation between the way you would size a Kanban loop <clears throat> and the elements that go into those calculations and how they materialize themselves in the way a DDMRP buffer is designed. Kanban loop, the number of Kanbans you'll have, is going to be based on the daily usage times, the lead time, plus a safety stock assumption divided by the Kanban quantity. In other words, how many items can fit within the bin, if you will. And then we'll add a factor of one to create further safety on that. That will generate how big the Kanban loop is. And there's a direct corollary. If we took at the elements of this formula, decup our daily usage times lead time, that is what the yellow zone represents in a DDMRP buffer. Daily usage time is safety stock assumption, i.e. our variation is really the principle behind the red zone within a DDMRP buffer. So the more variation we have, the more red zone coverage we would have. If we were factoring that in, we would have a larger Kanban loop to help us protect against the variation rates. And then the Kanban quantity, that's what we order on average. And that's what the green zone represents in a DDMRP buffer. So in reality, what we're doing is taking the same concepts that a Kanban would be sized on, correlating that into the way a DDMRP buffer is developed <clears throat> and using that to create the visible signals as to when to act. When we come below top of yellow, we act by ordering to replenish up to top of green. And we've sized it in a manner to ensure that stock availability so that we can use true consumption as our planning signal. So with that as kind of the backdrop, I think there's clear evidence. You go back and look at that waterfall, you see that there is demand variation. It is inevitable in the industry, even though there's so much work that's been done and, and has yielded results for clients, there's still further ground to gain. 
uh, through the application of DDMRP concepts. We can paste them in the actual consumption. It's a true pool flow kind of environment, very much the way elements of the automotive industry work, especially with Kanban and the ideas behind the Toyota production system. We know that the DDMRP buffers improve stock availability. Service levels typically go up to the very high 90s, if not hitting 100%. And they do that typically with lower average inventory levels. With that, we've got a number of features that are kind of relevant for the automotive industry, which we wanted to highlight in the webinar today. The first is what we call the planning calendar. And we're going to do an illustration of that. And this is how do we ensure that we are ordering for pickup days or order days or shipment days that match to the tier that is supplying into us. That planning calendar provides the schedule order dates and ensures that we are ordering in line with uh, the vendor's calendar that we need to respect. Auto approval. Many of clients in our clients in the automotive industry and neither than others are using auto approval functionality now where the buffers are going to be approved automatically in the overnight runs. Uh, and that's, you know, given the confidence that they have that the buffers are giving them the right order recommendations. A concept called fixed reorder cycle, and this has to do with topping up a buffer that has a planning calendar order date coming up, but may not have all gotten all the way down into the yellow zone yet. And especially if it's on a once a week delivery schedule, we probably should order, if we can, up to top of green to fit that environment, as long as we can do that by respecting the MOQ. In some environments, there's a concept of weekly ordering, meaning that we're going to have maybe three pickup days in the week, but we're only sending the signal to the supplier one day a week. So we have to send a complete view of the ordering for that week, um, in effect. <clears throat> and that may include orders that are going to be picked up on three different days in the week. And this is important. DDMRP as a concept tells you what to order today, but it's not going to tell you what you're going to order tomorrow. And that's where our SNOP module and its forward-looking projections gives us the ability to support weekly ordering kind of patterns. And then finally, uh, we have API support for the EDI transmission of requirements to suppliers. And this makes the automation of those signals flowing from the Intuaflow logic back through the ERP to the uh, vendor via their EDI network uh, can be so uh, helpful. So let's talk about planning calendar. <clears throat> Planning calendars enable you to synchronize with your vendors uh, requiring fixed pickup or delivery schedules. So it can be used in a, a number of different ways. But the idea here would be that we have a supplier response time or a fixed lead time. In other words, if we order today, we can only ha have a request date that falls on Monday, Wednesday, or Friday in this example. There will then be a goods receipt time, which will be the time from the pi order pickup to when it arrives at our plant. That could be a few days, could be many days if it's an offshore supplier. But the idea is that we break the lead time up into those two components so that the supplier signal matches when they need to have the material available. The goods receipt time covers the period for when it will be in transit to the plant. And then finally, the full effective lead time would be the combination of those two that allows us to manage to that. Um, in the planning calendar environment, uh, if we don't fall on a uh, what's called a scheduled order date, it will not order. Okay, it's going to wait until schedule order date equals today to align in this case to a Tuesday Thursday ordering environment. Um, so its schedule order date is visible in the software in the workbench. It shows when the next day is that uh, we'll be able to order. Uh, we also have a concept here that, that allows vendors or uh, users to understand how many days of supply do they have until they're going to reach yellow. That can help improve the order alignment and uh, synchronization with the schedules. <clears throat> Auto approval. I'm going to go through and illustrate these for you in the software here in a moment. Auto approval has to do with giving your system the ability to generate the orders automatically. MRP systems kind of do this. In buffering logic, we typically have users doing a review and approval, but obviously if you want to automate all of that, we can do that through this auto approval function. You can select which locations within your network have auto approval enabled, uh, and then you select which days of the week you want the auto approval job to run and the time of day that that job will run. So it will typically happen after your daily imports happen, um, everything is updated at that point. New orders would be recommended as a result within the application. 
If items have been selected for auto approval, the auto approval job will pick them up, approve those orders, put them into the pended order basket where they'll be retrieved automatically back into the ERP system and dispatched out to the vendors for execution. Auto approval is a great feature and it's uh, one that we hope to see more and more clients taking advantage of because it will simplify the workload of their planning staff, <coughs> allowing them to focus on other priorities. Fixed reorder cycle. This is when we're ordering on a fixed reorder cycle. We have a planning calendar typically in effect, and yet we want to be in an environment where we can protect stock availability. So if we're on a weekly planning calendar, and by that I mean an item that has just one scheduled order date per week, um, and we want to keep our inventories lean, we want to make sure we can keep the buffer skinny, if you will, by ensuring we don't stock out. So we enable the feature called fixed reorder cycle that says, if the item is still in the green zone, but it has room between the net flow and top of green for at least an MOQ, and it has this feature switched on, it will then generate an order to top up to top of green. And this allows us to have really a leaner buffer because we know that we're gonna be making an order it also helps the vendor supplying that material have a, a confidence that they're going to be getting orders on a weekly basis, and that helps them balance and synchronize their own schedules. So um, this is a great feature. Uh, it's been used by a number of clients since we implemented it a couple of years ago, and it really helps kind of complete the story, if you will, from the standpoint of um, DDMRP logic within an automotive environment. Uh, there are times where clients were only getting a EDI signal to their vendor once a week, but they may have multiple planning days a week, you know, say three or five even. Um, and they want to be able to give them DDMRP based orders for those days within the week. This is uh, absolutely a function of our SNOP module. We've got clients utilizing this technique. They take the order recommendations or the projected supply requirements coming from the SNOP module as their demand signal or their a reorder signal. And this allows them to send once a week, here's the orders that I need on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, if that's if they're on a three-day uh, calendar. This can be transmitted from the APIs, application programming interfaces within the software, out to the EDI infrastructure. And it really has worked quite, quite well especially when you're stuck in that paradigm where you've got just one signal going to your vendor on a weekly basis via your EDI network. Uh, the API link, there's really not much to demonstrate there, but uh, our software has a robust range of APIs, application programming interfaces. These allow us to integrate our solution with other systems on a very robust and systemic basis. Uh, the projected supply API within the SNOP environment is really what provides those projected requirements that can be then sent out to the vendors. And I'll show you those here in just a second when we cut over. Um, if you're on this weekly cadence, this can be a real great tool for generating orders that may um, otherwise have come from MRP and not really be aligned to what the DDMRP logic would be. Okay. With that, let's go over to the software now. And we're gonna start in site administration. I think I showed you um, kind of this panel. This is where we are enabling the auto approval. We are picking which location we've chosen the test location that we're gonna use. We have activated Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, five day week. Uh, this would run at 1230 in the morning AM. Um, we can have schedule order days on holidays. Some plants do this, some plants don't. It's gonna um, <clears throat> depend on those features. And then this uh, demand order window relates to another setting that will look at all the orders within the demand order window. And this is looking ahead further out, say maybe 10, 15 days, uh, and including those demands as part of the signal that it's gonna be planning against. So you've got some great flexibility there with how this works. I need to move this little panel here so I can see my buttons. Uh, that is then enabled at the item level. We have switched on auto approval. And uh, this is not being set up to be used in fixed reorder cycle at the moment, but it is set for auto approval. And that will be illustrated in the um, uh, SNOP modules forward-looking uh, basis. 
The planning calendar, um, uh, this is going to be set to uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. The first illustration I'm going to do is going to be one that is on a weekly planning calendar. I think I might have uh, changed this. Oh, uh, I didn't use fixed reorder cycle. That's right. So this is a projection. This is looking forward into the future from today at what this buffer activity is going to do. You can see um, the net flow line is dipping between top of green and into the yellow zone. It is missing over the weekend, then is going back and reordering, and we can see this pattern. You'll notice that it is on a planning calendar, which we had here Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays. And if we look at the dates for our supply orders being generated, you'll see that they're going to align to Monday, Wednesday, Friday dates here. You look in our date column here, you'll see that those align. We'll go to the June months. You can see an order on the 9th, on the 21st, on the 30th. This is the Monday, Wednesday cadence that we were looking at in our planning calendar. So it's respecting that cadence, and it is ordering based on the buffer needs based on that um, pattern. Now, what we can do though is, so that's how the planning calendars work. It's gonna respect those uh, planning calendar dates. The orders will only fall on dates that align to the planning calendar. And we're getting harmony with the way the vendor's working in this regard. If we come back to this part though, we can edit this now, and we're gonna turn it on for fixed reorder cycle. And again, what this is gonna do is gonna say, anytime the item can be ordered, meaning that there is room between net flow and top of green uh, for at least an MOQ, it is going to uh, generate an order. And you'll see a very, very different pattern on this when we run this item in this fashion. Um, one last thing I wanted to show you here, this is uh, the projected inventory report. <clears throat> you can see our average inventory. This is before we turned on fixed reorder cycle was 11. Um, buffer sizing shows that our expected average inventory is 11, uh, and you can see that's playing out in practice. The formula in DDMRP logic is all of the red zone plus half of the green zone is what your average order or average uh, on-hand inventory would be, and you can see that we're getting very much a similar result uh, with that based on the buffer projection that we had for this item going out in time. There's obviously a very stable demand pattern here that it's matching up to. So we've switched on auto or fixed reorder cycle. That feature is now active. We're going to rerun the SNOP module. Uh, this will only take about a minute. Um, and we'll be able to see now the difference in the order. Because we adopted fixed reorder cycle, anytime that buffer is ready to order based on the fact that there's room between net flow and top of green for at least an MOQ, it's going to generate reorders. And you'll see that uh, in a very different looking buffer trend graph when we show you here in a second. Um, it's going to show that the buffer is, is really ordering much more frequently. You can see down here, we've got quite a few orders coming through on the item. Here we go. <clears throat> and now you can see that NetFlow is never leaving the uh, green zone. It is ordering based on the planning calendar available dates. Um, as we go through, because it's ordering now every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And so we're getting a very, very different looking kind of buffer trend here. You can see inventory hovering much higher because of the fact that we are ordering so frequently. We're not waiting for it to come all the way down to top of yellow. We're ordering actually anytime there's room for an MOQ in our environment. And if we were to look at this one now on the average inventory, you can see our average inventory is going up to 13.6 from it was 11.08 or somewhere in that neighborhood. So what this illustrates is that we are topping up more frequently. We are protecting the buffer. In essence, we are carrying more stock to do that. So we always caution users that if you're going to use the fixed reorder cycle, it's a great strategy consider leaning out your red zone because you don't need as much protection because now you're going to be ordering on this dynamic, you know, uh, calendar, the planning calendar that we have in place and aligning in that kind of a fashion. Okay. <clears throat> All of this information in the projected supply, this report here is sent out, can be sent out to vendors. So in this case, I would see this as my rolling forecast on a weekly basis. If I look at the supply order file itself, I would know what the individual orders are going to be on each of the days. Some days it's five, 
two, two, one, two, two, one. It starts repeating that pattern as we go forward. And so this is how you would generate the rolling signal that would go out to your vendors uh, that they would be able to align to. Typically, the stability that you're creating by buffering at your level creates an easier signal for your vendors to support. I can't tell you how many of our clients have told us that their vendor performance improved after the client had implemented DDMRP, in part because they were not creating the bullwhip impact and getting the kind of noise of signal uh, that was happening previously. So let's just review real quickly and then we'll see if there were any questions. Um, obviously, there's a lot of complexity going on in the industry. The concepts of pull flow are very prevalent in automotive and I think they serve a great purpose there. Cascading of the signals down through the industry obviously is an important part of the story. Uh, there are fixed and frozen periods that need to be respected. There's the importance of coordinating the logistics side through things like planning calendars and the like. We know that in spite of all the efforts to try to get stability, there still will be demand pattern variation, and it's important to manage that correctly. That's where we believe the pull concepts of DDMRP can be so relevant and critical to uh, getting better success, yielding lower inventory levels, but better part availability. The concept of DDMRP buffers here is very much in line with the same concepts used in Kanban loop sizing and the like. And I think the, the, the point I would really emphasize here is that the more effective we are in managing variation, uh, the more effective we will be in managing our overall supply environment. Uh, features such as the planning calendar that we've illustrated, auto approval, fixed reorder cycle, weekly based ordering based on DDMRP logic through the SNOP module uh, are all great enhancements that really allow us to fit the automotive uh, community in a great, great way. So with that, I'm gonna stop the presentation and see if we have any questions to answer. We do <clears throat> We do have a question, Eric, related to the planning calendars. Um, do planning calendars support monthly order dates? Yes, actually I didn't show that, but yes, indeed. We can have obviously days within a week, every other week, every once a month. It can be a whole range of different stories that you have to be able to respect. Um, given that vendor's environment or your planning requirements. Okay, uh, we have another one. Do Intuflow APIs link directly to the EDI network? It's not a direct connection. The, the signal, the content coming from our APIs would be, is quite useful in the EDI network, but we don't direct directly connect to the EDI network. We typically want our clients to process those through back through their ERP system. That way they've got it in their system of record. Uh, and there's, you know, all that kind of traceability and transparency from that standpoint. But um, we've not directly connected our APIs to an EDI network as of this date. Okay, I don't see any other questions. Okay. Well, look, I want to thank everybody for your participation today. I really appreciate your interest. Um, we're excited to be working with so many automotive suppliers, companies like Michelin and Aptive and others, Caterpillar, that are in that uh, organ, uh, that industry. Uh, there's obviously exciting times coming with the changes happening in the industry and the like. And uh, we hope to be part of that journey with all of you. So uh, thanks so much for your time and attention today. And I want to wish you all the best on your own demand-driven journey.